All right, and the last time I read my Bible, he, God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And while in America we may not have a false idol like a Buddha or a carved image, I'm afraid many times because of our humanistic society, because of postmodernism and relative truth, that we make ourselves to be God. I am the highest authority in my life. And you can't tell me anything because I don't think it's wrong. I don't feel I am a God. All right, and it is wicked. Because God is a God, and He is, in case you wondered, a jealous God. He does not share that throne with anyone or anything. Anyway, don't, make me, don't get me stopped there right there. I'll stay there for a little bit. Sometimes uh, music is the sole factor by which we judge a ministry. It is a factor, but not the sole factor. There are other issues at stake, too. How do they handle the gospel? What's their view on soul winning? What Bible do they use? Or we say this, music doesn't matter. Who cares what I listen to in my car? Jesus. Then we looked at some principles, Ephesians 5.18. There are some commands we looked at where Paul says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. He goes on to define that, verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Just to remind you about that, because I love those three things. One time I heard someone say, well, psalms are psalms from the book of Psalms, and hymns are like, how great thou art, and come thou found, and spiritual songs are songs like victory in Jesus. Actually, it's probably not the most accurate defining of those terms in that verse. Um, the word psalms can be a reference to the book of Psalms, or on a, on a rudimentary level, it just means songs that have instruments and music with it. Hymns are uh, exempt, exempt, ah, an expression of praise. A spiritual song, and I love this, as Paul describes it, is that which is opposed to carnality or the opposite of what is of the flesh. Oh, I like that. Paul says when you speak to yourself in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, there are going to be some things that are opposite the flesh, and those are spirit or spiritual songs. So that tells me there are acceptable songs and unacceptable songs. Right? You see that? Now I just have to, with the Lord's help, decide what, where they each are. Our music influences others, but it's directed toward God. We looked at Colossians 3, 15 and 16. And we looked at Psalm 95, where they make a joyful noise under the rock of our salvation. And then tonight we'll start at Psalm, verse, Psalm 40, verses 1, 2, and 3. The Psalm of David... He wrote about 70-plus psalms in the book of Psalms. And David said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock. He established my goings, and he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Let's pray tonight. Lord, I thank you for your word, for this time we have to look at your word, Lord, in an adept way as we look at music. Lord, I pray that you would guide my thoughts and directions tonight, Lord, though I have tried to do my due diligence and study, Lord, and be accurate to your word. I need your spirit to, to help me. Lord, help those who listen, that we would listen to your spirit as he speaks to us and brings the truth to our heart. Lord, I pray that if there's any false ideas or thoughts about music that would oppose your word and your goodness and your glory, Lord, that you would correct us and you would change us and illuminate those areas in our heart and lives. Lord, may we have the willingness and the humility to respond to you like we ought to. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. amen. Psalm 40, verse 3, David says, and he hath put a, or the next two words, please, Try it again. He and he hath put a new song. In my mouth, even praise to my God, many shall hear it. Well, we have to decide and look at what does it mean to have a new song. I think there are a couple different uh, applications and definitions of this. One such is, uh, or the question is, does this new song mean that once I am saved, everything that I used to listen to is an old song and everything I listen to after I'm saved is a new song. Is it the same as Paul says to us when we're, we're a new creature, 
old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. Is, is he, David referring to the concept that everything over here is old and should be rejected, and everything over here is new? And I think that is one um, explanation for that concept of a new song. That once you become a Christian, once you follow God, once you believe and have faith in God, there is something different about the songs that you sing. Something different. If someone gets saved and listens to the exact same music, I would submit them to this passage and say, pray about whether you're listening to a new song. All right? And then we'll look at it specifically in this passage in a very practical way. Because I think the passage itself helps us to define, these verses help us to define exactly what he's saying. He says in verse 3, and he hath put a new song. If you were to follow the rest of the psalm, the rest of the psalm changes in what he says and how he acts. Once again, let's look at verse number 2, where David says, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay. Before, in the end of verse 1, he says, and he heard my cry. Do you get the picture that David is happy or sad with that description? He's sad, right? Is he going through a terrible thing that he's coming out of into verse number 3? Right? A horrible pit, horrible pit, miry clay, or can we say it this way? Was David in a place of defeat? Right? And he is opposing that thought with this thought, and he has set my feet upon a rock and established my going, and he has put a new song in my mouth. So if we look at this passage, what David is teaching us is that there was this attitude of defeat and sorrow and depression and God changed it, pulled me up out of the miry clay, out of the horrible pit, set my feet in a rock, and he gave me a brand new song. Got a thought for you. A new song is one of praise and worship and victory and joy. Any music that speaks of defeat and sorrow is not fitting to a new song from God. Does a Christian live in depression or victory? Help me. Victory. Does a Christian live in defeat or in triumph? In triumph. That doesn't mean we don't make mistakes, but our spirit, that's what David says, right? He has put a new song on my mouth. I can't help but think of the old joke about what happens if you play country music backwards. You get your wife back, your dog back, your Ford back. Is music of defeat a new song? You say, well, pastor, I like country music. I don't care what you like. I'm just saying, look God's word. And don't get mad at me. Why don't you take it to God in prayer? And say, God, does this music you, you let me listen to, does it bring victory in my life or defeat? Now, some of you aren't going to like that. You're not. You're going to say, Pastor, you know what? I can listen to my music if I want to. And you're exactly right. You can. You get to do what you want to do, and I get to do what I want to do. Except one little caveat in that. One little caveat we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for things done in the body, whether they be good or evil. Who gets to decide when I stand before Christ? Me? Lord, Lord let me tell you why this is good. Lord, let me just give you a little explaining right now, Lord. All right, this obviously was good. Listen, as I look at my Bible, I say, wait a second, my music should, be, should speak of victory and joy, and it will affect others. This says, many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. You know what a new song does in this passage? It causes others' hearts to be turned toward God. 
Does your music cause others' hearts to be turned toward the Savior? Well, I like it. I'm sorry. There's probably a lot of things that our flesh likes that have no place in our life. I know on a practical level, I'm still on the keto diet. There's a lot of things that my flesh likes that has no place in the keto diet. Well, that's stupid. Well, now we're getting somewhere. A new song. The principle of a new song that my music speaks of victory and joy and not defeat. All you have to do, it's really simple, folks. Next time you're in your vehicle, pull out your phone to stream some music. Before you do that, why don't you spend some time with God in prayer first? With a humble spirit that says, God, does this fit the test of a new song in my life? With an open mind, God, through his spirit, will guide you because the Holy Spirit says to promise us to guide us into all truth. He'll lead us in that. Well, I'll turn over to Revelation chapter 5. We're not done yet. I'm just getting warmed up here. Revelation chapter 5, please. Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. The Bible says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. Oh, what does this new song look like? It's going to tell us, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Sounds like defeat, doesn't it? Or does it sound like victory? Or does it sound like, wow, we triumph with God's blessing and help? You sing that song right there, many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. If you're in Revelation, go over to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15. Once again, a, a, uh, a snapshot of heaven or the future. Verse number 2, And I saw, as it were, John, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Are there going to be harps in heaven? Yes. Yeah, at least here there is. And verse number three, and they sing the song of Moses. Moses wrote three songs that we know about that are recorded in Scripture. Three songs. It's intriguing to me that the song of Moses is sung, not a song of David. I don't think this uh, just interesting that at this point, a song of Moses is sung, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. This is a great song. What is it saying here? The words of the song, the lyrics of that song. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Those oh, are some good words right there. You read those words, your heart is pointed like this. They say, well, is that the, the words we have to use in our church? No, it's not the only song to sing. But I think it gives us a good pattern of what we'll be singing or what, songs will be, what type of songs will be sung in heaven. Right between those two passages. If that's the songs that are sung in heaven, can we learn anything for our time here on earth? Well, yes. Yes, we can. Because obviously these are songs of praise. These are spiritual songs. And I look and I see that these songs... They're directed toward our wonderful God. They describe Him, and they describe what He has done. Now, get this. There are some people, good-meaning people, that say, well, songs that talk about, like, the actions or what happened, like, like and they'll say this, like, victory in Jesus, they're very man-centered. And, and what's better songs to sing are things that talk about, about God and describe His character. 
And so that's fine. I, I, don't, I don't have a necessarily problem with singing about God's character. These songs do that. But they also talk about what God did. When I read the songs in the Bible, I go back to the song of Moses after the Red Sea. You know what Moses is saying? I'm going to paraphrase it. God, the Egyptians came in the water and you wiped them out. They thought they were big, but you're bigger. Actions about things he did. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. I think some songs are going to apply. So I don't, I don't get mad at someone who says, well, I only want to sing about God's character because that's wonderful. You know, this, that's what that says. Thou art worthy. All right, that's God's character. And, uh, but I think you're missing something if you said you can't talk about what he did. All right, I think I look at what happens in heaven. They sing about what, what Christ did. So just a side note. Well, that's, I think, some teaching in the Bible. I then see about the music in the Bible some examples. We looked at some commands, Ephesians and Colossians, some teaching from the book of Psalms and Revelations, and now some examples of music in the Bible as we try to decipher what does the Bible say about music. We want to start with the Bible. We don't want to, we don't want to just add the Bible in. We want to start with the Bible. And so as we look at examples of the Bible, first of all, I see corporate examples in a public setting. Colossians, Ephesians, the book of songs, the children of Israel, and the disciples at the Last Supper. They sung in him. There are quite a few examples of corporate singing. Singing that happens among a group of, of whether they're disciples, uh, God's chosen people, the Israelites, a church, Colossians, and a church at Ephesus, Ephesians. So we have the church, and we have the Jews, and we have disciples in a corporate setting, singing together. I think that helps us, helps us paint a picture for when we gather in a corporate setting, should we sing together? There are some who say no. You say, really, pastor? Yeah. I look in the Bible and I see a corporate, a corporate setting for music to, to be sung. I have a biblical principle for why we have a song service at First Baptist Church. It's not because we always done it this way. Because really that doesn't particularly matter whether we've always done it. You know, you can do it the wrong way. Uh, you, you've heard that story about the, about, about the, the, the lady who, who always cut off the ends of her roast, right? You heard that illustration? Always cut the ends of her roast, and one time her husband asked her why she cut the ends of her roast, and, and she said, well, my mother always did it that way. It's the way you have to cook a roast. She got really perplexed, so she asked her mom, why do you, why'd you cut the ends of a roast? And, you know, what does it do? Does it make it more moist or tender? She goes, oh, no, dear. My pan was never big enough. <laughs> so we don't want to sing just because the pan wasn't big enough. But I see a corporate example of singing. Remember, when we looked at those commands, it was always about lifting up our voices. Psalm 95, a joyful noise. That means if you sit there and sing like this, you're not singing like the Bible teaches us to sing corporately. We ought to be singing, well, pastor, someone will hear me. <laughs> read Ephesians again. Read Colossians. Read Psalm 95. Read Psalm 40. And every situation, it says, many shall see it. Others shall be touched. That's the point. Well, pa Pastor, I'm a little off key. You may not know this, but we already know that. <laughs> you don't hide it that well. And I would much rather, I would much rather us quit worrying about us being off key and start worrying about singing to the creator of the universe and singing some praise and, and really, uh, to use a secular term, to raise the roof in this auditorium. To just sing out because we care about singing to our Savior, our Creator, and great and marvelous are His works. And many shall see it. So someone walks in who's never been to church before and like, wow, what is going on in that place? Because those folks sing. Those sing. Now, we're not a bad singing congregation, but I don't think we're, we're exactly where we ought to be. I know that sometimes under the balcony it gets a little bit dicey because you feel like you're singing all alone. That ought to make it easier for us. Because some of you sing louder in the shower than you do at church. Now, maybe because you're singing songs that you shouldn't be singing, and you know them better than you know the church songs. But I'd like to just say maybe it's because, maybe because you feel more comfortable 
in a private setting. Well, the balcony makes it private, so sing out. Well, somebody will turn around and look at me. Let them look. If you're singing for them, let them look. But our, our, I'm serious, our services, our song services ought to be just, just, you know, just cr cranking in here, all right? Because we're singing to him. And we got enough voices in here. I get after the teens sometime, like you girls know this, and, and uh, we'll be going to, back, we'll be on a bus like to camp, and man, you kids on the bus to camp, like, I can't, I couldn't hear myself drive. Right? You girls know this, and boys, you know this. Just being crazy. You come to church, we're like, we're church mice. Come on. Come on. Let's not be louder at a sports game than we are when we meet our Savior. I see corporate. I see singular examples. In Luke chapter 1, Mary. Mary, after the angel comes, uh, she sings. I would say, I would argue that she sings a song. My soul doth magnify the Lord. About 11, about, about 10 verses she sings. It's almost the exact same construction as every single psalm that we find in our Bible, which would have been sung. I think Mary, after the angel walked away or flew away or disappeared, she had no response but joy. It came out, the New Testament teaches us, in a song. You ever been so happy you just can't help but whistle or sing? Come on, you ever had that? Where your just heart is just almost bursting in praise? What do you do? You, I mean, you start singing, you just start singing or humming. You're like, man, somebody hears you, well, what's wrong with you? I, I, I can't help be happy. That joy comes. I see a singular setting. I see Moses recorded three songs recorded in Scripture. David, 75 plus songs. Solomon. In 1 Kings 4, verse 32, it says, Solomon of Solomon, and he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He had 1,005 songs Solomon did. We don't have all those recorded, all right? But there's somewhere. Asaph had songs. Deborah had a song. Japheth's daughter had a song. She was the one that Japheth uh, made a promise. Whatever comes out to greet me, that I'll offer to the Lord. And Japheth's daughter came out, and he was just, you know, terrible. But she went off, and she sang a song. The sons of Korah had songs. There's so many singular examples of songs in Scripture as well. You can't get away from music in the Bible. I find an example of a song used after tremendous victory. That's Exodus chapter 15. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord, and he spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Remember I told you about that? Moses was a song leader and a songwriter. Maybe waving that staff. I don't know what he was doing, but they all sang with him. They followed his lead. They sang when David brings back the Ark of the Covenant the first time and the second time. First time in 2 Samuel 6, verse 5, and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. Man, they were making a ruckus because the Ark of the Covenant's coming back. And the second time, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the Ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. You remember it was the second time that it was such an emotional display that Michael, or Michelle, his wife, criticized him because he made a, she thought, made a fool of himself in front of all of Israel. David, you made a fool of yourself. You were, you were singing so, so much praise to God today. Now, wouldn't that be something? If you go home and, man, your, your wife says, you made a fool of yourself at church today, you're singing so loud. Honey, you made a fool of yourself, you're singing so loud. You need to cut that out. You're a fool. That's what she said. And David says, <laughs> he said, I'm sorry. You missed it. He says in 2 Samuel 6, verse 21, it was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people, of the, over the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. David had it right he said, you were embarrassed, woman. He didn't say woman. He said, you were embarrassed. You were embarrassed because you thought I made a fool of yourself, but you missed the point. I was singing to him. 
and God set me in this position, therefore will I play before him. I can't be moved by what you think. Because it's not for you anyway. It's for him. I see an example of David's. I see an example when David played his harp for King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23. It came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Now I submit this is a rather difficult passage in some ways to, to work through. You say an evil spirit from the Lord. You say, uh-oh, did God send a demon to plague Saul? Now I would, I would submit that, it was per, that whatever happened, it was permitted by God. Nothing happens without, without God's permission. He allows Satan to have some to have some power on this earth only by his permission. God could stop it tomorrow or today even, right? He could stop it, but he, but he has not chosen to always. I don't know if it was a demonic oppression or if it was a depressed spirit. If you read three commentaries, you'll have three different opinions. If you read five of them, like I did, you have five different opinions. Or really four and a half because one guy's out in left field, all right? This is what I know, that Saul had some type of just heaviness on him, whether demonic or personal depression, that I know. And that I know this, when David played on his harp, and I have to believe that David was always writing the Psalms. It's kind of how David operated, it looks like. He's always singing to the Lord, it looks like. When David began to play, but that music had an emotional and spiritual effect on Saul. And that whatever was happening to him left. And that David was touched by the Spirit of God. And I say that because in 1 Samuel 16, verse 18, just five verses previously, then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and here's the phrase, and the Lord is with him. This is great, all right? Get this. Once we got saved, who came to live inside of us? Who is it? Help me. The Lord, the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity who is God. David had the Lord with him and they noticed it. But as a Christian, we have God with us. So that when someone brings the ministry of music, all right, God touches that. And I know, and I'm sure many of you do, that spiritual music can uplift your soul on a spiritual level. An example. Another example was music was played at a time of mourning. In Matthew, Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. So we have many examples. I'll give you just one other little section tonight, and then we'll, we'll, be, uh, uh, we'll stop for tonight. There are some positive and negative effects of music in the Bible. I want to give you just one negative effect right now. If you would turn to Exodus chapter 32. A negative effect of music. I think there's a valuable principle in Exodus chapter 32. Moses is up on the mountain. He's communicating with God, and Joshua's a little bit further down, not where Moses is at, but Joshua, as a minister to, to Moses, has, has helped his, his teacher, his master, if I could use that word, as, as a disciple and as a protege. The people are down there at the camp, and Aaron has asked for all of their gold, their earrings, they all throw an earring down, and, and Aaron fashions a golden calf. Later on, he lies about it and says, well, I threw in the gold and out pops this calf. I've had a lot of fires at my house. No calves have ever popped out of them. Ash, fire, where I don't want it, okay, but not a golden calf. At this time, they begin to worship this golden calf. They begin idol worship. And the idol worship involves music. 
In Exodus chapter 32, verse 15, And Moses turned and went down the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of, what's the next word? War in the camp. And he said, this is Moses speaking now, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that, what's the next word? Sing, do I hear. It came to pass as soon as he came in nine of the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. Let me give you the principle and then talk about it real quick and then we'll kind of pick up here next week. Our music always sends a message. They're coming down the mountain and Joshua says, Sir, I hear something. They're having a big fight. There's war in the camp. What he heard sounded like war. What does war sound like? Does it sound beautiful? Does it sound like praise to our God? Many shall hear it and see it and fear the Lord? Or does it sound like chaos, a cacophony of sounds, right? And Moses said, no, son, paraphrasing again, no, son, That's not war. That's singing you hear. When I was over in Ghana, um, one of the men there gave us a testimony. His name was Bismarck. He had gone to a funeral. The funeral was, they used a traditional uh, religion there and they used drums there. There's a lot of information about the drums there in Ghana. They use what's called polyphonic beats. It means nothing, unless some of you music nerds like myself. But I'll tell you this, he played a little bit of of the funeral um, scene. Brother John wanted me to see it and and kind of hear what was going on. He heard these things, and a polyphonic beat, drums, when they're used in polyphonic manner, every drum is on a different beat than the next drum. In a musical notation way, it's impossible to notate this completely because they're not even in the same time signature with the other one. All right, now I know I'm over your for some of you, okay, so I, my background is I was trained in music at Bob Jones, grew up music my whole life. I started playing trombone when I was in third grade, sang my first duet, I think in fourth grade, with Scott Annual, and have enough class to have a music major from Bob Jones, all right? So I, I am not an expert in music, but I know a lot of music. Um, studied classical, sacred, you name it. And this, this noise that was coming from the cell phone that this man had was a cacophony of utter chaos. All right, and that is the point because it brings this, this thing, you watch the people and their response to it, all right, in this funeral. And it was, when I saw it, I instantly thought of this passage. It was like a war. People just throwing themselves around and this, this sound, this sound. A lot different than when we come to church and sing in harmony and melody. In fact, there's a lot of music out there in the USA that when you hear it, sounds like war. There's a lot of music out there that is Christian that doesn't sound Christian. Doesn't sound like praise. Our music, or I should I say this way, music sends a message. The only people who say it doesn't are carnal Christians. All right, now let me explain that. All right, because I am serious about that statement. The only people who say it doesn't send a message are carnal Christians. Unsaved Musicians understand the message of music. That's why in commercials, unsafe people design these things. 
they're sending a message with the background music. Theme tracks, soundtracks on movies, unsafe people send a message to the music. That's why in a scary scene of a movie, the music becomes low. Dum, 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 dum. Because music sends a message. The only people who say it doesn't, and they'll say like this, well, it's good because the words are good, are carnal Christians. The only people. Musicians know that music evokes a response and sends a message. And Moses and Joshua knew that. See, that's what we be careful with music because we may be sending the wrong message. All right, well, I am not done with music yet, but I'm done tonight. So place there for questions. Um, we probably will not get to questions next week with music because I still have some more material to go through, just so you know. We're getting there. We're kind of working through it. But I, I hope if you have some questions, you can ask them on the way. I try to be as clear as I, I can be, but I'm sure I've glossed over some, some things and confused some things. I'm not trying to at all. But I, I just want our heart to be turned toward God. Let's start with this book, all right? And ask God, God, how can we pattern our lives after you? All right, for your glory, for your honor, Lord, may my life be pleasing in your sight. And if it means stepping on my toes of what I like, Lord, then step on them. All right, stomp on them. You crush them. I don't care because I care more about pleasing you than my flesh. All right, Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I say you'd help us as we, Lord, just maybe begin to pray and think and contemplate what your word says about music that you'd begin to minister to hearts. Well, there may be someone here who maybe has struggled or struggles, Lord, or maybe is, is working through now what they ought to do and listen to. I pray that as you promised, you'd guide them into all truth. Lord, may they look at your word and communicate with your spirit. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.